Hello, I'm Sarah Donovan and I'm delighted to be part of this year's Advent Calendar. I will be reading for my debut novel, Within You, Without You, which was published by Valley Press last month. The novel set in Yorkshire, Liverpool and Cork and spans two time periods, um, 1993 and then uh, 20 years later. It's a story of Catherine who, late one night, while driving home to see her mother, she encounters a figure on the side of the road who she's convinced is Ed, her first boyfriend, but Ed died 20 years ago. I will read first from the prologue and then a little bit further on in the book in chapter 13. Recently, he had come to her in her dreams. As she slept with the Atlantic waves crashing against the nearby rocks, she met him again. She could not remember what they spoke of or if, if they had spoken at all, but on waking she could clutch at the glow of him before it ebbed to that place which lay beyond reach until the next time. And now, although she could hardly make him out on a wet November evening, she knew that he was here again. But this time she was awake, and this time he was real. Hunched against the driving rain, hands in pockets, head bowed, walking towards her on a darkening road. The wipers were no match for the rain streaking down the windscreen, so she leant forward, squinting to get a clearer view. She only saw him for a moment before bright lights appeared in her mirror. As the truck bore down, she accelerated past the figure, now stepping onto the grass verge. She glanced to the left, glimpsing his face for a few seconds until the truck blasted its horn. When the truck had rumbled past, leaving a dirty spatter on her windscreen, she pulled over and rever reversed into a gateway, returning the way she had come. She drove slowly, her heart hammering in her chest, expecting to see him walking towards her. Nothing. She stopped the car and jumped out, looking up and down the road. A car appeared, splashing her as it swept past, the red taillights disappearing around the corner. His name hadn't been on her lips for more than 20 years, but it had been on her mind so often. Ed, she called, timidly at first. Ed, this time louder. There was nobody there. But she was certain, more certain than she had been, that it had been him. She had recognised his walk, the way he had glanced across at the passing car. She had felt the essence of him. But a person doesn't just reappear like that, not when they died 20 years ago. The city centre took on a languid air on what was an unusually hot day for April. The sun blazed high in a pale blue sky, its heat seeming to pour through the streets, shimmering on the pavements and the buildings, so that pedestrians had to stop and rest a while on benches and the cooling stone steps of monuments. Catherine was early, so she sat on the grass in front of the grand buildings that made up the Three Graces to wait. The grass, scorched and spiky, prickled the sensitive skin at the back of her knees, bare from her last minute switch from jeans to the shorts she had had the foresight to stuff into her bag. It was too hot to care about covering her legs, and as she leant back to stare at the skyline, she wished she'd remembered to bring her sunglasses too. One liver bird, high up on the western side of the Royal Liver Building, continued to gaze out over the glittering waters of the Mersey to the chimneys and factories beyond. Constrained by thick metal cables that looked from this distance like puppeteer's strings, its wings were raised as if in readiness to rise into the sky in search of a cooling breeze. But bound as it was, it remained eternally prepared for flight, its back towards its mate, keeping a resolute watch over a city baking in the searing midday heat. Bare-chested teenagers with t-shirts tied around their waist cycled back and forth on the pavement, while the braver among them made their bikes rear like horses and showed off their wheelies to the admiration of the others and that of the three girls huddled on a nearby wall. Intent on hiding their interest in the boys' acrobatics, they licked ice cream cones and pretended to listen to each other. The heat hung heavy all around her, so Catherine went over to the railings at the edge of the dock in search of cooler air. Less than half a mile away across the lapping waters of the Mersey, the factories and chimneys of the Wirral Peninsula glinted and flickered in the brightness of the day. She picked out the dome of the town hall clock, standing sentry over the town of Birkenhead and its waterfront industry, and the dusky red silhouette of what looked like a place of worship, but was, she had been told, the ventilation tower for the tunnel that ran underneath the river. She noticed a flap of metal at her feet, rectangular and curved like the peeled back lid of a sardine tin. It glittered in the sun and then, picked up by the riverside breeze, it gambled and fluttered into the distance, coming to rest briefly under the railings, 
its next stop the river's silver ripples below. Like a baby bird testing its wings, it seemed alive. Here, along the river, there was a mysterious soundscape of booms, hums, and now and then loud scraping noises echoing across the water. This was what she had imagined the North to be like, a place where things were still made and loaded onto waiting ships, where men toiled hard and emerged weary and grime-coated from the doors of high-windowed factories before going home to their tea. Catherine was surprised out of her reverie by the sudden appearance of a melting ice cream cone. Here you go, you better eat it quick or it'll drip all over you, Elaine said, biting the bottom of her own cone and sucking the ice cream through the hole. Thanks for listening.